So in the last couple of videos, we've talked about these two definitions, which form the groundwork of measure theory. The definition of a sigma algebra, and then the definition of a measure, which, as you can see, depends on the definition of a sigma algebra. So, just a, a real quick review. A sigma algebra on R, or, or really on any set, we, we could have used any set, we just chose to use R, is a, a collection of subsets. So, it, you can think of it as a subset of the power set of R, if you want to. Or just, just a collection of subsets of R that contains the empty set, that contains the complement of all of its sets, and that contains the union of all of its sets as well. So it's pretty straightforward to think about what this means, and it also has to contain countable unions. It doesn't necessarily need to contain arbitrary unions, and I haven't thought too much about whether it does contain arbitrary unions or not. But for now, we'll just assume the only thing that we're asserting is that it has to contain countable unions. So after pausing this video for a second, I actually thought about it, and I, I can think of an example of a sigma algebra that does not contain arbitrary unions. So just think of the, uh, the sigma algebra generated by all of the singletons. So it's going to contain each singleton in R. Every, every point is going to be in a sigma algebra, and every countable union of points is going to be in it, as well as complement. So the complement of every countable union, and and the complement of those, but but if you take uh, the complement of one of those, you just get the countable union. And if you take the union of complements of countable unions, you're going to get some intersection of countable unions when you take that thing's complement. And so the only kinds of sets that are going to be in there are singletons, finite sets, countable unions of finite sets, which which are themselves countable, and sets with comp countable complements. So that, that's the, uh, or, or finite complements, of course. So you're not going to get any, say, bounded open intervals if you take that sigma algebra. So that's an example of where we're closed under countable unions, but not closed under arbitrary unions. And I didn't write any of that down because that's not, that wasn't the point I was trying to make with this video. Um, and then the definition of a measure on R is that it's a function from a sigma algebra to this, uh, interval from 0 to infinity, and it could actually include infinity because some sets, you might say, have infinite measure, right? The measure of the, of the reals itself has infinite measure, at least uh, we, we would like to think it does, depending on how we define our measure, but we'll probably define it in a way that, that gives the reals infinite measure. So, so we, our function needs to be able to take on the value of infinity. So mu is the, the Greek letter mu is what I'm using to represent this function, this measure. And it has to be a function from a sigma algebra. Mu of the empty set has to be zero. If the empty set doesn't have measure zero, I don't know what it does. So we may as well require that. And then it has to be sigma additive. So if you take a bunch of pairwise disjoint sets, the measure of their union is the sum of their measures. All of those are, are reasonable things to assume about any anything that we're going to use the word measure for. Of course, we could assume whatever we want since we're making up this definition, but but if we're going to use the word measure, there seems to be a reasonable thing to assume. I'd like to prove a couple of properties of, of measures, but first of sigma algebras. So let's go ahead and start with a couple of uh, properties of sigma algebras that I want to point out real quick. So the first property is that if E is in a sigma algebra F, and, then, and actually, let me, let me take a countable. Countable, countable number of e's. So e sub 1, e sub 2, e sub 3. We can keep going. All of these e's are in a sigma algebra f. Then their intersection is also in the sigma algebra f. So we, we've assumed that their union is in the sigma algebra f. But now we're going to show that their intersection is in the sigma algebra f. And in fact, this is equivalent based on the other axioms to show that their union is in f. So how do we do this? Well, the intersection from I, the intersection from I equals 1 to infinity of E sub I is equal to the complement of the union from I equals 1 to infinity of E sub I complement. So if something is in all of these sets, then it's not going to be in the complement of any of these sets. So it's going to be precisely not in the union of all of the complements. And this is just a, a 
De De Branges, De, De Bruegel, De, De somebody, De Moivre, I don't know. Some, some guy has these theorems that, that show that, that these two things are, are equivalent, and I can't remember his name, obviously, but uh, that they're very fa famous theorems in set theory. And, and so we have the we know that if E sub i is in the sigma algebra, then E sub i complement is in the sigma algebra. And if E sub i complement is in the sigma algebra for all i, then their union is in the sigma algebra. And then that tells us that the complement of their union is also in the sigma algebra. So that's how we do it. It just follows from the two properties we already know. And then, of course, we can use finite sets as well. If we want, just, just repeat copies of, of these as you know, many times as you want. So, and then the next thing is if E sub 1 and E sub 2 are in the sigma algebra F, then E sub 1 minus E sub 2 is also going to be an F. And this set right here is the set of everything that's in E sub 1 but not in E sub 2. So if, if let me draw a uh, kind of a, a Venn diagram just to, to make this clear. That is, if that's E sub 1 and this is E sub 2, then E sub 1 minus E sub 2 is going to be precisely the things that are in E sub 1 but not in E sub 2. So it's going to be this. It's not going to include the things that are in E sub 2. But it, um, but it's not just, yeah. So, so that's that's basically what what e sub one minus e sub two is, and we can see easily that that thing is going to be in F if e sub one and e sub two are F just by the the properties that we already know are true. So let me get rid of that. I don't need it. To show that, well, we know that um, we know that e sub if e sub 1 and e sub 2 are in F, then we know e sub 2 complement is in F. Oops, that 2 should be a, a subscript, not a superscript. e sub 2 complement is in F. And then e sub 1 intersect e sub 2 complement. So we're using the property that we just proved equals e sub 1 minus e sub 2 is also in our sigma algebra F. So that's how we know that uh, that we can subtract sets from each other and that we're still within the sigma algebra. So that's, that's all helpful stuff to know. Now, let's show some things about measures. So, properties of measures. One, there are going to be four properties. The first property is monotonicity. And that is that if E is a subset of F, and if we assume they're both measurable, then the measure of E is less than or equal to the measure of F. Right? I mean, it wouldn't be much of a much of a measure if that weren't true. And it turns out, just based on the axioms we've already shown, that certainly is true. Another thing that needs to be true is sigma subadditivity. So this is going to be very similar to sigma additivity, except we are not going to require that the sets be disjoint, and hence the uh, the conclusion will be a an inequality rather than a necessary equality. So if e sub one, e sub two, all the way down to infinity are in this sigma algebra, then the measure of their union. is going to be less than or equal to the sum of all of their measures. And I hope that's that's fairly intuitive that if you take if you take a bunch of sets and you take the union of all of them, well then the then when you take the measure of their union, it's certainly not going to be greater than the, the sum of all of their measures because well, where would the extra extra length, if you will, have come from. Remember, measure is sort of a, an extension of length, or a, a generalization of length. So it wouldn't make sense to take things that are, uh, to take a bunch of sets and they add up to something longer, especially if you're taking their union. Taking their union should, if anything, only make them smaller, and that's what this theorem says. So we can prove both of these fairly easily, and we will in just a minute. Let me go to number three now. Three is going to be called continuity from below. 
And this is a nice property as well. It goes like this. If e sub 1 is a subset of e sub 2, is a subset of something else, and that's a subset of something else, uh, and you can go all the way down to infinity if you want, then the measure of their union, union from i equals 1 to infinity of e sub i, is going to be equal to the limit of their measures. Now I'll draw a picture in in just a second. Limit as n goes to infinity of the measure of e sub n. I'll draw a picture in just a minute. First let me let me give my one more property. Continuity from above. As you can probably guess, this is going to be a similar property, uh, except this time e sub 1 is going to contain e sub 2, and so on all the way down. And if that's the case, then, and if e sub 1 has finite measure, Then their intersection from i equals 1 to infinity of e sub i is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the measure, sorry, this should be the measure of their intersection of the measure of e sub i. Now, both of these hopefully feel fairly, fairly straightforward, and, and we'll, let, let me draw a picture of, of what continuity from below means. I'm actually going to act like I'm in R2 now, even though I said I'm only behaving in, in R1. I'm going to go ahead and break that for just a minute here. So assume everything has been has been defined in Rn in exactly the way we've defined it in R. And let's say this is E sub 1. And let's say, uh, let's pick another color for E sub 2. And let's pick another color for, whoops, that should still be E sub 2. And let's pick another color for E sub 3. That'll be more like that. And then e sub 4, and we keep going like this. Maybe these don't all have to be circles, but, but that's fine. Or ovals. But that's what I've got for now. Okay, so these sets keep containing each other. And maybe they expand all the way to infinity. They, they eventually take up all of R2. Or maybe they have some limiting thing where they, their union is maybe this box, or maybe something else. Who knows? But the idea then is that the measure of their union, whatever that union may end up looking like, is the, the sum, or sorry, the limit of their measures. And then we, we can also imagine if, if instead of uh, this down here being e sub 1, e sub 2, e sub 3, e 4, we imagine that this is e sub 1, and we have e sub 2, e sub 3, e sub 4, and it keeps going, we get smaller and smaller sets. Maybe, maybe they, their intersection is empty, maybe their intersection is a point, Maybe their intersection is uh, some set of positive measure, who knows. But the measure of their intersection is going to be the limit of their measures, again, similar to sigma additive, uh, similar to continuity from above, from below. Now, what I want to do next is show you an example where um, uh, of continuity from above and, and show you why we have to specify that E sub 1 has finite measure. The reason for that is because if we were to take some set, and I'll go back to uh, the good old real numbers now, just just R1. We'll go back to R1, and let's say we have this, whoops, I, I want a, uh, a horizontal line here. It's sort of my xy axis, I guess. And we go back to R1, and let's think of uh, this first set as the set of, I'll put the first set up here, but, but you can imagine the set actually being on R if you want. So the set from 0 to infinity. And then my set number 2 is going to be the set from 1 to infinity. And my set number 3 is going to be the set from 2 to infinity. 
and set 4 is a set from 4 to infinity. And as you can see, what we get is we, we get a, a series of sets, or a sequence of sets, and each is contained in the other, right? So it satisfies this, this property here that uh, each one, uh, number 4, that e sub 1 contains e sub 2, contains e sub 3, and so on. But, but e sub 1 does not have finite measure. Now, if you look at the, the intersection of all of these sets, well, there's not a single point that is in the intersection of all of these sets, because eventually, let, let's pick this point, or pick, pick any point, I, I guess, really. If you were to pick a point um, x, and let's say x is right here, well, then x is in e sub 1, and x is in e sub 2, and it's probably in e sub 3, but then eventually it's not, in, it's not there anymore. And if x is less than some number n, then x is not going to be in e sub n plus 1, or e sub n plus 2, or anything greater than that. So, so the intersection is actually the empty set, uh, despite the fact that each of these sets itself has infinite measure. So we've got, we've got infinite measure, the limit as n approaches infinity of mu, mu of e sub i, well, that's the limit as n approaches infinity of infinity, because each individual thing has infinite measure. But then their intersection has measure zero, so this equality certainly does not hold if we don't assume that, that at least one of them has finite measure. Now, I'm actually going to prove these, since the video is getting long, I'm going to prove these four properties in the next video. But there you have them. That's the statement of the four properties of measures, and we've already proved some properties of, of sigma algebras. So let, we'll go ahead and do the proof in the next video.